Hey everybody, hope and pray that you're doing well today as we come to our word from the word. And today that word is victory, victory. Now a little bit of change of scenery. Uh, it's such, such beautiful weather. Uh, just enjoying this time out here at the picnic shelter. And uh, I just thought I'd do this out here today. But um, we're continuing in Nahum. Uh, in ending in the first chapter, we're going to look at verse 15 uh, today. I told you it's a very short book and you can sit down and read it all in just a very short period of time. Uh, but today I want us to remember the, uh, the enemy, right? Remember that Nineveh is being destroyed. And that's the whole message um, throughout this passage and uh, throughout this book. It's the message of Nineveh um, being destroyed and, and how for Judah, this is good news. And that's what verse 15 is really about. And that's what we're going to focus on today. But I want you to keep in the back of your mind that, that Judah would have been remembering all the pain and suffering that they had been through. They would have remembered all the oppression uh, that they had had at the hands of the Assyrian Empire. And, and they would have been upset about all of these things and continually just living uh, really without hope. Right. Um, they had hope in God, and but they weren't living it out. Um, and how often we do the same thing, right? We say we have hope in God, but then when, when circumstances change, then we kind of, uh, well, I don't know, God, if this is really where you want me to be. But God had a plan and uh, he had not forgotten them. And uh, if you remember, we finished off yesterday talking about the stronghold uh, that God is. And Romans 8, 31, I'll repeat it again, says, what then shall we say uh, to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us. So as we look here in Nahum chapter one, looking at verse 15, he says, behold on the mountains, the feet of him who proclaims, I'm sorry, the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feast, perform your vows for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Now, see, even as we, we hear that and imagine hearing that message for the very first time, imagine hearing uh, the same words that Isaiah said, Isaiah 52, 7, Isaiah said it this way. He said, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. You know, uh, Paul, even in Romans 10, 15, he refers back uh, to this same passage uh, in Isaiah, um, talking about how beautiful the feet of those who proclaim the gospel of peace. And let's just think about that, just in, in the fact that even as we go out proclaiming the gospel message, that it's the same idea, that how beautiful are the feet of those who go out and do the will of God who go out and proclaim the word of God and the, the beautiful gospel message. Now, just as this was a message of, of victory, right? That's our word for today is, is victory. But it was also a news, uh, a, a news bulletin of peace. I mean, could you imagine today if it was, you know, everybody says, well, we pray for world peace. Well, that's not going to happen until sin is eradicated. Uh, until Jesus has taken over in the, uh, everything and all things and, and those who have turned against them are condemned to hell forever and ever and ever. And then we as believers live uh, with him for all eternity. That's the only time that there's going to be world peace. And it's when there's a new heaven and a new earth. And, and so to think about this, right, that, that all of these things, this is a message of peace that's coming. A message of victory. And even as it's, it is um, physical peace for Israel at the time and physical victory for them at the time. Oh, what a foreshadowing this is of, of the end times and the even the coming of Christ. And then uh, even furthermore, on to our future, to the end times. But the point is, is that none of it was going to be utterly destroyed. They'll, they will no longer march through the land again. They will no longer have rule and reign uh, over Judah anymore. And, and what a message of peace this was and a message of victory that it was. Because you think about it, that's why he says, now you can resume the feast. You can resume the celebrations. 
Right, and that's one thing we talk about even with, with COVID, right? We, we look forward to being able to resume the feast, the good old Baptist feast, and resume some life of normalcy. But this is so much more than that. It, it's that you can now resume serving God the way that you wanted to. That's why he says you can perform your vows. All the things that you promised God that you would do, now you can do them. Now you can serve him with all your heart, soul, and mind, right? Now there's no oppression getting in the way. There's no uh, enemy there uh, knocking you down over and over again. And man, what a, what a great, again, what a great picture this is of the victory that we have coming once we're in glory, that the enemy is utterly defeated, utterly destroyed. So you might even be thinking, now, wait a minute. So that means that I, I can't have victory until then. But see, that's the one reason that I want to make sure that we point out that here's the point for us today, right? We're not Judah, right? We don't have a, a Nineveh that's, that's coming, um, that has been oppressing us, that's going to be overcome uh, and wiped off the face of the planet right now, right? That's just, that's not the case. Now, you might try to make all kinds of applications across the world today, but that's not... Um, biblical. And here's the point. The point is that at Calvary, when Jesus Christ suffered and bled and died for you and for me, see, the point is, is at that moment, then when he died on the cross and then as he was buried and, and in the grave and all that time that Satan thought he had won. Oh, but on that first Easter morning, when, when Jesus arose victorious, rose alive out of the grave, See, then death, hell, uh, the grave, all of that was defeated, utterly destroyed. And he said, now, wait a minute. The end time says there's still going to be a, a battle there in the end. Um, well, it is, but it's really one sided because I can tell you Jesus is going to win. How do I know? Because I've read the end. Right. I've read the book. I, I've, I've skipped ahead to the end. Right. You know, and, and we know how the story is going to end. But here's the point is that at the moment uh, there at Calvary and that resurrection of Jesus Christ, victory was already won. Right? It was already sealed. And, and the point is, is that through all of this, I, if we really understand that Satan is already lost, that the, the ultimate eternal punishment of sin, right now we have a way out and it's through the blood of Jesus and, and through Jesus alone, I might add. But see, now all that's been defeated. See, that is the great gospel news of peace and, and victory. And, and oh, blessed and uh, beautiful are the feet of those who talk about that gospel of peace. Who are going out telling a lost and dying world that, look, you don't have to be defeated by Nineveh. You don't have to be defeated by sin any longer. That you can have victory and the victory has already been won. All you have to do is trust Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So maybe you're watching this today and you say, well, look, I've already done that. So I guess really the question could be for Christians, for believers today is, you know, first, do you have that victory of Jesus Christ in your life? Do you have that? Do you possess that victory of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? I mean, you can even go back and look at our Holy Spirit series to, to, to see the, the proof of the Spirit living within you, that proof of salvation, that proof of change in your life. So first and foremost, do you have the victory of Jesus Christ in you? But then my follow-up question to that is something that we all need to uh, examine for ourselves. Do you live like you have victory? So many of us go around and seem like we, we walk around and, and live our lives in a way that it seems like we're already defeated. Like Satan has won and he continues to win. Now, I know we all struggle and I'm not saying that we don't. But the point is, do we act like we have victory in Jesus? I mean, we sing it, right? We sing it in church that we have victory in Jesus. But do we really mean that? Do we really understand that through the saving blood of Jesus Christ that we have? victory in Jesus. See, because when we understand that, then we can resume the celebration. We can resume the feast, right? We can resume all the things that, that sin had, had kept us from doing. We can resume praising and glorifying the God, God the way that he called us to do. And then how we can fulfill our vows. We can continue to praise and glorify the name of Jesus in the way that we already told him that we would. You say, well, wait a minute. When did I do that? Well, 
What about that moment of salvation when you turned your life over to him and said, God, you do with my life whatever you want to do. That's what it means to make him Lord of your life. So today, do you have the victory of Christ Jesus in your heart today, first and foremost? And secondly, are you living your life like you have victory in Jesus? I pray that you are. God bless you and have a great, great day.